Bruno Diaz uh, was introduced to hypersonic research in 2012 at the Von Karman Institute for Fluid Dynamics through an internship followed by a research master's program. Um, this is not in his bio, but that's okay. Look, I'll put your bio in the chat and you just go ahead and get started. All right. Um, thank you, JB. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, the, the efforts we are doing at AIMS to, to develop a unified solver. So this is quite a preliminary results. Uh, but is, um, I will talk mostly about the methodology that we are following. It. So uh, throughout the, um, the, um, the, this uh, workshop, we have seen several talks on the, on the, on the uh, uh, hypersonic entries, right? And uh, how to design TPS. And uh, the point here is that um, if you are working in this field, what you want to do is to improve your models such that such that you have a better uh, prediction on TPS design. And uh, during your hypersonic entry, you have uh, at high Mach numbers, you have all sorts of uh, non-equilibrium effects, and you might uh, also have uh, some radioactive fields. And all of these will result in a high close into the material. And if you have a material such as pica, uh, you start to have uh, the composition of, of the phenolic resin, which uh, uh, will end up with uh, some uh, pyrolysis gases. And then uh, we also have uh, reactions of the fiber, so we can, uh, uh, can have oxidation, nitrification reactions of the fiber. And if the fiber is weak enough, then you can, these fibers can break and uh, you, you result in a process called uh, spallation. So the point here is that uh, as long as you are ablate in your material, these ablation products will also affect the, the flow flow, the, 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 the boundary layer and uh, eventually will also change the heat flux that the, the material also feels. So this is the main message here. And the question is, how can we model uh, the interaction uh, between the flow uh, and the material? So traditionally, uh, the, what most of people do is what I call a decouple approach, where you can either use a flow field solver or a material solver to, to model the, your TPS ablation. So um, the the, Typically, in your flow field, you assume that uh, it reaches a steady state and you use uh, uh, special boundary conditions to, to represent the ablation process. And in the material, uh, you can use some input from the, from the flow. Um, and you, you, you also assume that the ablation process is in chemical equilibrium, which is a quite strong assumption. The most advanced technique is the weak coupling approach where the flow and the material, the, the exchange information uh, through boundary conditions, uh, you still assume that the flow uh, is in steady state and you have a sort of iterative process between this, this communication between both, both solvers. And the idea here is that the flow field uh, adapts instantaneously to any shape change of your material. And then you have a more advanced approach, which is uh, the unified coupling approach. I don't know why is this thing here. Uh, where you solve the, um, the, the, the flow field and the material equations in the same computational domain. And this is quite nice because uh, uh, if you have a porous medium, you don't need actually any uh, special treatment to track the interface, but still you are required to derive effective properties between the pure fluid and the material region. So at, at the interface, you are still required to derive this, uh, these properties. So this comes to the objective of my talk, which is to develop a unified solver in Pato. So this is the, the topic of my postdoc as well, that I'll, I'll be doing at AIMS. Uh, the first step was to derive the average governing equations that allow to solve the flow field and the material in the same computational domain. And, uh, <clears throat> and in order to close these uh, average equations, we also need to derive uh, effective properties uh, between the flow and the material interface. So this will be the second part of my, uh, of my, um, of my talk. So this is the outline of, of this presentation. I'll first uh, mention how we can derive these uh, governing equations that uh, allows us to solve the fluid and the material in the same domain. We call them volume average and average stokes equations. Then I will mention how we can uh, close uh, these equations. So how can we derive these effective properties that allows us to close the, the governing equations? And then I will conclude and I will give some uh, ideas for the for our future work that we have in mind. Okay, so let's say that you have elementary volume located in X 
this elementary volume it can contain two phases. So it's a beta and a sigma phase. So it can be uh, a gas and a solid phase. And you can solve a uh, governing equation inside this elementary volume at the power scale. So here I'm showing just uh, a norm, uh, governing equation that can present mass, momentum, and energy with some source terms. Uh, obviously, if you want, uh, if it's computationally impossible to solve these uh, these equations at the power scale, if you are interested in a, a large scale problem, so what we can do is to average this equation. In, in this volume. And the formal way to do it is to convolve the governing equations, the power scales equations, with a filter function, which I call it M. And in the end, we end up with the average equation, which I'm showing it here. And the definition of the average is, so I'm showing it here, is nothing more than, as I mentioned, the convolution of your uh, power scale property with a filter function. Uh, here, I'm just showing the, the definition of the integral. And what is important to, to, to take care of here is that we need to define a phase indicator function. So phase indicator function of, let's say, the beta phase is one in the beta region and zero in the, in the solid region. Well, how the, that's what I'm showing here in this, in this uh, figure. So the next step is to define some average operators. So the idea is you want to bring the average inside the time derivative term divergence and the gradient. And by doing that, and thanks to this uh, phase indicator uh, term here, you end up with some uh, surface properties. So we end up with some extra terms that are active at, between the surface, uh, uh, at the surface between the, the two phases. So that's what I'm showing here in this red, red part right here. So in the end, oh, sorry. In the end, if you, if you, if you put, put these terms there, you end up with a final average equation which takes this form. And you can see that you have three uh, extra terms which are active uh, between, uh, between the interface of the beta and sigma phase. <clears throat> For instance, if you are solving the continu continuity equation, these terms will give you the surface mass balance. And if you are solving the energy equation, this will give you the energy uh, mass balance, uh, energy, uh, surface energy balance, like the, the previous talk the, was shown in the previous talk. So what is important in all this process is to define uh, the, the filter function M. So it's, uh, that's what I'm showing here. So the objective of the filter is to obtain uh, well-behaved average properties. And what do I mean by that? Let's say that you have a, a filter that is too small. Then what we'll get is what we call microheterogeneities, which is just the interaction between the gas and your solid. So you'll have a very uh, weird behavior. And if you're, um, filter is too big, then you'll have uh, macro heterogeneities, which means that your, your, uh, your uh, elementary volume will feel the variation of your micro scale uh, properties. So what you want is something in between. Uh, uh, the filter has some properties. For instance, he has a compact support. And if you integrate over the volume, you have to, you needs, you, the result has to be equal to one such that you have still uh, conserve your uh, properties. The, there are the many filters that you can use. The most popular ones are the top hat filter, which is suitable for disorder porous medium. And I'm showing here, it just has a constant behavior. So the kernel is, is basically one inside your elementary volume. And then there is the cellular filter, which is more suitable for uh, order porous medium, which the kernel is like this. And it's just the convolution of uh, two uh, top hat filters. So the filtering procedure presumes the decomposition of length scales. And what do I mean by that? Um, let's say, so your, uh, you, if you have your porous scale quantity, which I'm showing it here, you can decompose that into something that contains information, information at the large scales and something that contains information at the small scales. And uh, let's say that you have a, a behavior, like your porous scale behaves like this in the, in the entire domain. What you want to do is you take your elementary volume and you move around R cube and you end up with something like this. So you end up with an average behavior and a, a residual. So important question is, is the average of the average equal to zero? So I'm saying that this is an important question because the moment you start to expand all your terms in your volume average equations, you end up with this, uh, with this problem. 
Uh, so let's make the, the simple exercise. Let's take this term here, which I'm showing it here, and let, let's expand it around R, uh, around X, doing a Taylor series expansion. And you can see that we end up with these extra terms here. So if, if, we, if we plug this back to this equation here, we see that the average of the perturbation terms is not exactly equal to zero. So the, to answer this question, the answer is no, unless you choose your filter wisely. And what do I mean by that? Uh, it means that the size of your filter matters. So if you are using a top hat filter, it has to be, the size of your filter has to be much bigger than your micro scale, or lens scale micro lens scales and much smaller than your macro lens scales. It turns out that for the cellular filter, the, the size can be of the same order of your micro uh, uh, lens scales because uh, it has nice property and all these terms go to zero. So in the end, if you, if you follow this rule, the, these terms goes to zero and then the average of your perturbation is, is basically zero. So after expanding all their advanced terms, we end up with some source terms, which uh, I call, so I'm showing you an example just for the momentum equation. I call it the drag, uh, drag source term. And this uh, drag term represents the pore scale interaction between the fluid and the material at the macroscopic level. So you can see here that this is just the integration of, uh, of your pertur perturbation terms at this uh, interface between the sigma and the beta phase. And uh, you can recognize this as the Darcy, Darcy law, as was also shown in the previous uh, talk. And uh, from here, you can actually see where, where it comes from. So what we did next was to uh, simulate a um, uh, porous domain inside a, a closed channel, as I'm showing here. And uh, this is called the Beavers and Joseph problem. So we impose a certain a mass flux and uh, the flow will feel the presence of the of the porous region and will start to deviate. And it will feel the presence of the, the porous region precisely because we are penalizing the momentum equation with this term. So if you focus now in this, uh, in this region over here, so I'm going to show the velocity in the y direction. And we can see that the velocity in the porous region is uh, almost, almost zero. And, and then it, it, it grows. Uh, and this is kind of a puzzle flow. So here I'm showing the, our results uh, compared to, to some methods. Okay, so the next uh, topic I'll be talking is the, the closure. So how can we derive these uh, permeability uh, terms? So to, to derive this uh, interaction between the, the flow and the material, we really need to look into the DNS uh, scale um, and that's what we did. We, we perform a, a simulation at the DNS scale. To, it's the same uh, geometry as the Beaver-Joseph problem. So here I'm just uh, simulating a, a Cartesian grid of cubes, which represent your porous domain. And I'm imposing a certain mass flux such that the Reynolds number is equal to one. And this problem is periodic, so we can focus in a reduced domain, which I'm showing here. So these are the results. You can see that the velocity in the porous region is almost zero, and in the free fluid part is uh, is kind of a puzzle flow as the as the macro scale results that I've shown previously. And here I'm showing the, the the pressure variation. You can see that at the interface between the fluid and the porous medium, you can see some effects of the pressure as well. So once you have these DNS simulations, what we can do is filtering these these results. And I recall that uh, in order to have macroscopic results, we need to filter the, the porous scale quantities with a certain uh, filter function. So if you, if, you, if you do that, if you filter the, the, the phase indicator function, so it's zero in the, inside the cubes and one outside the cubes, you end up with the porosity. And if you, you, if you filter the, the uh, porous scale pressure and the porous scale velocity, you end up with the average pressure and average velocity. So in this case, we use the, a cellular filter, which the kernel is shown here. And the size of our filter is around 4DS. So it's four times the, the size of these cubes. So the idea is we take this box and you move it around X, uh, Y, the Y coordinate, in order to get our average quantities. So that's what I'm showing here. I'm showing the, the porosity, the variation of porosity. 
uh, in the porous region is around 0 0.875. So it's the, the analytical uh, solution for this geometry. And you can see the variation of porosity uh, across the interface. Uh, and then in the free fluid part, you, you reach to a value of one as expected. What is interesting here to see is that the, our interface is around uh, 3 bs, so it, 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 it has a certain length. And also here I'm showing the, the average velocity. Oh, oh, sorry. The average velocity. Uh, and you can see that the, there is a significant change of the average velocity uh, across uh, the interface. So if we take these, these average quantities, we can uh, derive the permeability. So here I'm showing the, um, the so-called darcy brickman law. Uh, normally this term is neglected for homogeneous porous medium, porous medium. So it's just, if you take this term and this term is just the normal Darcy law. But it turns out that this term is quite important, especially at the interface between porous medium and the free fluid part. Um, and uh, by solving this equation, we were able to, to derive the permeability coefficient, which is shown here. And uh, that's what I'm showing this plot. So you see that the, the permeability in the free fluid region is zero, and then it grows, and then it kind of ha has a overshoot, and then it reaches a, a synthetic value. And this overshoot is, it comes from, from, from this term, from the Brickman term. So you can actually, uh, and you can notice that uh, if you want to derive the effective properties at the interface, it's quite, it's quite it's important. Minute warning, Bruno. Yeah, sorry? I just said two, two, two minute warning. Yeah, I'll, I'll conclude. So the, the, the message here is that this term, Brickman term is quite important if you want to derive uh, effective properties at the interface. So I will recall the objective. I, we want to develop a unified solver uh, in Pato. And to conclude, the, the full uh, volume average uh, Navier-Stokes equations contains several microscopic terms which require some closure. And the, the choice of the, the filter is quite important to derive these effective properties, especially at, at the interface. And uh, the fidelity of this unified approach, it really relies on how you derive these properties of this region, in this region. As a feature work, we'd like to include some fiber oxidation model and to compare that with some experiments carried out at Ames. And also we would like to derive uh, interface properties for more complex uh, microstructures. And with that, I'll finish my presentation. If you have any questions. Great, thanks a lot, Bruno. Um, so we do have uh, a question from Henry Ran on slide 12 and 13. It looks like the pressure is almost not changed in the porous region and the speed is much slower. Is the density increased a lot? So th these are in compressible simulations and the pressure is a kind of relative pressure. So it's the variation around the uh, P0 pressure, reference pressure. And the question was, can you repeat please? Sorry, I was muted. It looks like the pressure uh, is almost no change. So it's not changing in the porous region and the speed yeah. is much slower. Is the density increased uh, a lot? No, the, the, so the density, is in compressible simulation, so the density doesn't change, and indeed the pressure doesn't change much around a certain P zero. So it's just, it's, yeah. This is the um, sorry, it's the pressure divided by the density. It's not like pressure in Pascal, right? Kinematic pressure is. Yes. 